Hello to everybody. And uh, there we go. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. And, you know, I think that there is so much that we can all do to make Alzheimer's a rare disease, which is exactly what it should be. It should not be the incredibly common disease it is today. It will kill of the currently living Americans, unfortunately, it will kill about 45 times as many as the pandemic. We're over a million now with the pandemic in the US and we're looking at about 45 million of the currently living Americans, unfortunately, unless we do something about this. And we've now trained over 2000 physicians in 10 different countries and all over the US. Uh, some of them are getting really fantastic results. And in fact, in our trial uh, with Dr. Hathaway and Dr. Gordon and Dr. Toops, uh, really fantastic uh, physicians, 84% uh, of the people improve their scores. And on the other hand, there are other physicians who are not getting very many people to improve. So I thought it would be very helpful to talk about achieving best outcomes. What does it actually take? What are, how do you do troubleshooting? What are the critical features to get the best outcomes? Because of course, when someone comes to you with cognitive decline, one of two things will happen. Either you will make them better or they will die, unfortunately, because Alzheimer's disease is unfortunately a terminal illness. And until recently, there really hasn't been anything, as people have said many times, everyone knows a cancer survivor, no one knows an Alzheimer's survivor. Well, as I'll show you, we now have many of them. And the longest now are people that started in 2012. We first began this protocol. And so they're now a decade into this and still doing very well. So the idea is that when you're actually addressing the things that are causing the decline, then people can sustain their improvement. Whereas it, with a drug, if you get any bump at all, you're gonna go right back down to declining because you're not attacking the root cause of the problem. So first of all, it's helpful to know what type of Alzheimer's. There are people where it's more inflammatory, people where it's more atrophic, etc. And of course, many have combinations, but it's a good idea to get an idea when you first see the patient, is this person's Alzheimer's mostly or their pre-Alzheimer's, hopefully, because we like to get them as early as possible, as I'll talk about in a minute. So is this mostly an inflammatory problem? So we call this type one or inflammatory Alzheimer's, people with infections, often chronic undiagnosed infections with leaky gut, sometimes with autoimmunity. Is this more a type two? These people look very different. The type one is kind of your typical uh, you know, person literally, uh, typically it's in their late 60s. They've got this ongoing inflammatory process, um, often with leaky gut, et cetera. The type two atrophic people, this is typically someone who's in their mid 70s um, that has just doesn't have hormones, just doesn't have trophic factors and often is decreased in their nutrients. So they often present somewhat differently. And then glycotoxic, we call this type 1.5 because it actually has features of both. It has the inflammatory feature because of the non-enzymatic glycation of proteins, which of course we measure as hemoglobin A1C, but of course, hundreds and hundreds of proteins are glycated. So they don't work as well and they are more pro-inflammatory. On the other hand, it also has insulin resistance and therefore the insulin isn't the, doesn't exert the trophic activity that it usually exerts on brain cells. And therefore they also have an atrophic picture. So they have some of both and we call this type 1.5. And then type three is toxic. And this can be from inorganics, metals, air pollution, things like this, can be from organics, things like benzene, glyphosate, and things like that, or it can be from biotoxins, trichothecenes, and things like that. And then, oops, okay, there we go. Type four is vascular. Um, typically these people have reduced cerebral blood flow and often can have a mixed picture of a vascular dementia and Alzheimer's. But in fact, vascular abnormalities are common in Alzheimer's disease. And so therefore you wanna include going after those things. And then finally, traumatic. And in fact, there was an interesting paper uh, by Dr. Gareth Roberts, classic paper many years ago, showing that when people had severe car accidents, and actually passed away within 10 days, they had massive amounts of amyloid within their brain. So in fact, amyloid is a relatively early response to trauma, 
Over time, that may be cleared and you're left with a tauopathy, which we refer to as chronic traumatic encephalopathy. But the idea is the same, that you can get with repeated head injury an increase in Alzheimer's disease. Now, it's important to point out that one of the biggest problems today is that we have something called mild cognitive impairment. And so doctors will often see their patients say, you know, don't worry, it's just mild cognitive impairment. Come back next year, we'll see how you're doing. So this is like telling someone that they have mildly metastatic cancer. It's actually a relatively late stage of Alzheimer's disease pathophysiology. So we'd really like to get to people before this because you go through four phases when when you develop Alzheimer's. Phase one, no symptoms at all, but if you do spinal fluid analysis or PET scans, you can actually show that people already have begun on the pathway to Alzheimer's disease. So what we used to think of as a disease of our 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s is really a disease of our 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, which is diagnosed typically 20 years after the pathophysiology begins. So the better we can do at getting people to come in early, getting on active prevention for anyone who's 45 years of age or older. If someone is at late stage in the nursing home, please get all the children to come in, get evaluated and get on active prevention. If you don't do that, then at least as the first symptoms appear, don't wait. Uh, unfortunately, doctors often tell their patients, that's just normal aging, don't worry about it. Right up until the point that they tell them, oh, guess what, it is Alzheimer's and there's nothing I can do about it. Now, if you don't get on active prevention and you enter this phase two, SCI, subjective cognitive impairment. This actually lasts about 10 years. So you can see that, in fact, we have a huge window of opportunity, both in phase one and phase two. And what we see repeatedly is that nobody who gets on active prevention and does the right thing actually progresses to dementia. So it's highly effective if you do the right thing. Furthermore, virtually everyone with SCI can return to their baseline. So this is very effective. It's the third and fourth steps that are tough. Now, by definition, what SCI means is you have cognitive symptoms. Often your spouse will notice it. Often your, your coworkers may notice it, but you're still testing in the normal range. But this is relatively common and something that we can all deal with very effectively. Now, you can see then that the third stage, which really should be called advanced Alzheimer's disease because it's the third of four stages, is unfortunately labeled mild cognitive impairment. Well, as one patient said, there's nothing mild about it. At this point, you've gone so far that you're already testing in the abnormal range, but you still have, by definition, your activities of daily living. Five to 10% of, e of these people each year will convert to full dementia. And so this is, a, again, a late stage. And then the final stage we call Alzheimer's disease. So it's a little bit like waiting to treat, uh, you know, waiting to treat diabetes until you're in diabetic ketoacidosis. It really makes no sense. You wanna get people when they have insulin resistance, not when they progress through prediabetes, full diabetes, and then all the way to ketoacidosis. By definition, when you have Alzheimer's, your activities of daily living are affected. And this is typically about 20 years after the initial biochemical changes. And that's been documented by longitudinal PET scans and longitudinal spinal taps. So that this is really a disease that is unfortunately diagnosed very late, and there's a tremendous amount you can do. As I said, virtually everyone in phase one and phase two do great. Most of the people in phase three, in our clinical trial that, uh, that I talked about last time, um, this was in people with phase three and phase four, and still 84% of those people improved, but a lot has to be done. The later you are, the more that you have to do. And it's tougher. We have seen people even with MOCA scores of zero end stage Alzheimer's improve, but they don't come all the way back to a perfect score of 30. So we can get people from 18 to 30. We can get people from zero to nine, which gives them you know, better ability to dress themselves, speak, et cetera. But we're not yet able to take people from zero end stage Alzheimer's to a perfect 30. That's one of the big goals. Can we get people all the way back to perfect? Mm -hmm.